It all started right where it ended, at St. Malachy's Church in Tyrone, Northern Ireland. In December 2010, beauty queen and teacher Michaela Hart and sports star John McCarivy tied the knot, sharing their celebration with over 300 guests. However, just three weeks later, John returned with the body of his young wife, who was buried in her pristine wedding gown. What led to Michaela's death? Who could be so heartless and calculated as to take the life of a woman, who had just begun to enjoy married life with her beloved? And will the collaborative efforts of multiple countries help uncover one of the most memorable, and harrowing crimes of recent years? The captain of the Irish football team, John McCarivy, and the daughter of one of the country's top football managers, Michaela Hart, met at university in 2005. It was love at first sight, and since then, the young couple had never been apart. During a vacation in Paris, John proposed to Michaela, and she happily accepted. They planned their wedding for New Year's Eve, on Michaela's 27th birthday. After the ceremonial wedding, the newlyweds boarded a plane, embarking on their three-week honeymoon. They spent the first week in Dubai before the most anticipated part of their trip began, two weeks at the Five Star Legends Hotel, located in the fishing village of Grand Gauba on the northeast coast of Mauritius. Michaela chose Mauritius as their paradise island for the dreamy honeymoon and carefully researched local hotels. They settled on Legends Hotel due to its numerous positive reviews and popularity among tourists from Ireland. Upon arrival at the hotel, they asked the receptionist if they could be allocated one of their best rooms. They were informed that there was a vacant room in the luxury block, room 1025. January 10, 2011, after having breakfast together, John decided to play golf while Michaela sunbathed. They met again for lunch. Michaela always enjoyed having tea with something delicious after lunch. She asked her husband to order tea while she went to the room to get Kit Kat bars with her favorite dark chocolate, which she had brought from Dubai and kept in the refrigerator. John offered to bring the treats for her, but it was only 150 steps from the restaurant to the room, so she went by herself. John took some photos and watched videos while waiting for his wife to return. After some time, he began to wonder why Michaela hadn't come back yet. He decided to look for her. Knocking on the door, John received no response. Since he had forgotten his key in the room, he peeked through the window but couldn't see anything, so he went to the receptionist. The corridor attendant led him back to the room and opened the door with his key. However, as soon as the corridor attendant took a few steps away from the door, he heard the cries of a man asking for immediate help. Upon entering the room, John discovered his wife in the bathtub filled with cold water. Bruises were visible on her neck, her skin was icy to the touch, and her lips had turned blue. Assuming that Michaela had intended to take a bath due to back pain but slipped or lost consciousness, John attempted to help her. However, his efforts were in vain. Within an hour, medical professionals pronounced Michaela's death, bringing an end to the dreams of a young and happy married couple. Presumably, due to the initial assumption of an unfortunate accident, nobody attempted to secure the crime scene, and people constantly entered and exited the newlyweds room. The police were initially informed that a tourist had drowned, but upon entering the room and observing the state of Michaela's body and the disorder in the room, they suspected a murder had taken place. The distraught husband was taken to the police station and held for questioning for five hours. This was not unusual since most murders are committed by individuals close to the victims. What was abnormal in John's case was the cruelty and inappropriateness of the statements made by the police officers. Naturally, John couldn't hide his tears over the loss of Michaela. Just half an hour earlier, he had seen his wife happily walking towards their room, but now he discovered her lifeless body in the bathtub. However, upon seeing his tears, a police officer, perhaps trying to console him, said, why are you crying? You're still young. You'll find yourself a new wife. It is unknown how long they would have kept John at the station if it hadn't been for the hotel manager's intervention. 
The manager informed the police that the door of room 1025 had been opened with a stolen master key that fit all the locks. It became evident that the murder had been committed by someone from the hotel staff. It was likely an unintentional murder. Someone among the staff, possibly a security guard with access to the master key, entered the room at 2.42 p.m. Two minutes later, Michaela opened her own door. The thief, possibly hiding in a small niche in the bathroom, had to quickly consider his options due to the unexpected presence of the maid. If his duties involved room cleaning, he could have simply smiled at Michaela, pretended to do his job, and nothing would have happened because it's a common situation in a hotel. However, if he was a security guard, he knew that his presence in the room would not be easily explainable. So, the only option he saw for himself was to hide in the bathroom and hope that the woman would simply leave, but that didn't happen. As investigators speculated, Michaela decided to take advantage of the opportunity and entered the bathroom. Inside, she encountered the thief. Michaela got scared and ran, and the thief, in panic, attacked her. Realizing that he had killed Michaela, he placed her in the bathtub. Perhaps he tried to create the appearance of an accidental incident with the maid. Despite the shock, he may have also thought that water would wash away any DNA evidence left on his victim. When John got up from the table at 3.05 p.m. and went to check why his wife was taking so long, the killer was still in the room. If John had his keycard with him, he could have caught the killer at the scene of the crime. However, by the time he went to the administrator, asked for the door to be opened, and entered the room, it was already 3.26 p.m., and the thief, unintentionally turned murderer, had vanished. Releasing John put the police under immense pressure. When a tourist is killed in a country that heavily relies on tourism, it becomes crucial to quickly solve the case. It seemed like the case would be solved promptly because the local police chief stated that the island had a 100% homicide clearance rate. One might think he was just acknowledging the efforts of his subordinates, but any professional would be suspicious considering that in 2011, besides Michaela, 30 other people were killed on the island, and all cases except Michaela's, were solved based on confessions from suspects. The following year, the police once again solved all cases based on confessions. The fact that the police excessively relied on instinct and intuition, if it can be called that, could have been compensated by the fact that the investigators had an ideal crime scene. The hotel room was cleaned every day, each entry into the room was recorded by the security system, surveillance cameras were placed everywhere, and the hotel itself was practically an impregnable fortress, with vigilant security guards everywhere. As it will become clear shortly, that was not the case at all. Within two days of the murder, the police arrested several hotel employees, and two of them, Avanash Tribhuwun and Sandeep Maniya, were charged with the murder while the others reluctantly became key prosecution witnesses. A week later, a hotel security guard named Dasan Narayanan was also arrested. Dasan was on duty on the day of the murder. His exact location at the time of the crime could not be confirmed, but his fingerprints were found on a fake key that the thieves used to replace the stolen universal key in the security room. Dasan couldn't provide a satisfactory explanation for how his DNA ended up on the safe door in the room. He admitted to touching Michaela's cheek when he rushed to help John, offering an explanation in advance for how his DNA could be present if it was found. However, despite Dasson's conflicting statements, the police decided to charge him only with being an accomplice to the thefts, focusing their main efforts on Avanash and Sondeep. On May 22, 2012, the trial began. The prosecution built its case primarily on the confession obtained by the police, following their customary practice. Prosecutors argued that when Michaela returned to the room on that day, she caught Avanash and Sandeep stealing money from the safe or her purse. Since hotel employees are often the main breadwinners for their families, not just immediate relatives, the thieves preferred to silence Michaela to avoid losing their jobs. During the trial, their colleague Raj Thikoy also testified. He was initially arrested but became the key prosecution witness and received immunity. 
Raj stated that he was near the room and heard the agonized cries of a woman but didn't knock on the door. Instead, he hid and saw the agitated and sweaty Avanash and Sandeep leave the newlyweds room. Later, he asked what had happened, and they replied, nothing happened, just keep quiet. If you say anything, we'll involve you in this matter. In addition to witness testimonies, the prosecutors largely relied on the confession obtained from one of the suspects, Avanash Tribu Woon, following the customary police practices. Despite the fact that Sondeep and Avanash were the accused, it created an impression that the police themselves were being judged alongside them, as they conducted a careless investigation. The defense attorneys drew attention to all the evident gaps, inaccuracies, and blatant errors made by the investigators. Firstly, after the discovery of Michaela's body, the hotel was not sealed off, and not a single guest or staff member was interviewed. Some tests were not conducted, while others were only performed after the hotel room was returned to the hotel's control, compromising the evidence. Fingerprints and palm prints were found in the room, but their owners were not identified. However, no DNA evidence indicating the guilt of Sondeep and Avanash was found. Even the paper currency, which according to the prosecutors interested the thieves, was not fingerprinted or examined for DNA. The court also heard that all the crime scene photographs were taken in black and white, and many important items were not photographed at all. But the biggest uproar was caused by the mystery of the 46 surveillance cameras capturing the events inside and around the hotel. Despite numerous requests, the police did not hand over the video recordings to the defense attorneys. It turned out that they did not withhold the footage because they didn't want to, but because they couldn't. 90% of the videos were erased by the police officers who were unable to operate the cameras. When asked to demonstrate how the equipment works, instead of honestly answering yes, they simply pressed the button. It happened to be the record button, and when they thought they were playing back the recordings, they were actually erasing them. The glaring incompetence of the police made international media wonder if the local authorities were deliberately sabotaging the investigation. Finally, the accused claimed that they only made confessions after being subjected to torture by the police. Dasan Narayanan, who allegedly gave Sandeep the keycard, claimed that he was forced to make the confession under threat of a weapon. Avanash also denied his statements, stating that the police tortured him and interrogated him with water, after which he vomited blood. Furthermore, he was allegedly told that his wife would be deported and he would be forced to live in Ireland with John McCarivy, who would now need a new spouse. Avanash stated that he didn't even read his own confession because he simply signed the document that was presented to him. Another witness stated that he was forced to give false testimony, even though he and Sandeep were actually in room 1009 at the time of the murder, where a VIP client was supposed to stay, and Sandeep insisted on his subordinate maintaining perfect cleanliness in the room. At one point, he even grabbed a mop himself and demonstrated how the floors should be cleaned. Additionally, Sandeep claimed that he was on the phone with his sister in Britain at the time of the crime, which was corroborated by telecommunications data. Finally, the preserved surveillance camera footage also confirmed that he was in a different part of the hotel at the time of the murder. Overall, the court proceedings, which were expected to last for two weeks, dragged on for almost eight weeks. This was largely due to the defense attorneys crossing the boundaries of decorum and turning the trial into a show. They constantly made jokes and elicited bursts of laughter among the board onlookers and law students present in the courtroom. The defense raised the issue of there potentially being a sexual motive for the crime, hinting at the involvement of Michaela's husband. They referred to an intimate aid they found in the hotel room and insinuated possible misconduct between John and his wife. However, it turned out to be a simple insert from a women's magazine, Cosmopolitan, which Michaela had purchased at the airport. They then attempted to prove that John and Michaela had a severe argument, presenting a video that allegedly confirmed this. However, the individuals in the video were not Michaela and John but rather two people resembling them from Germany. As a result, 
John had to contact this man on Facebook and request him to provide a statement at a police station in Germany, confirming that he was the one in the video. Overall, Michaela's family was incredibly distressed by the sensationalism surrounding the case of her murder. In particular, a local newspaper conducted a survey titled Who Killed Michaela? And John ended up ranking high on the list of the reader's votes. Additionally, the Mauritian newspaper published by the police the photos of Michaela's naked and bruised body, causing indescribable anguish to her family. Nevertheless, these eight weeks came to an end, and it was time for the jury members to make their decision. The judge summarized the case, clearly pointing out the guilt of the suspects, leading Michaela's family to believe that it would give the accused the right to demand a review of the case after a guilty verdict. They had no doubt that the verdict would be exactly as they anticipated. Furthermore, the judge strongly advised the jury not to consider the impact this case would have on the country's image but to make the right decision from their perspective. And after two months of trial, deliberating for only two hours, the jury declared Avanash and Sandeep innocent. After the acquittal verdict, John and Michaela's families were incredibly disappointed. They endured all the agony of the process, inappropriate remarks from attorneys and police, tolerated laughter in the courtroom, and even faced aggressive behavior from the locals because they were confident that the guilty parties would be punished for the murder. They were certain of Avanash and Sandeep's guilt and believed that they were acquitted because the case received global media attention, and the jurors did not want the murder case to reflect negatively on Mauritius' image. The Hart and McCavery families cannot forget that Avanash's lawyer appeared on a local radio station and essentially admitted his client's guilt, mentioning how Avanash cried and apologized to Michaela's family. The interview was supposed to be presented in court, but the lawyer managed to evade his responsibilities. John believes that Avanash told the truth when he confessed to Michaela's murder, and here's why. When anyone hears about death by strangulation, they imagine the killer choking the victim, gripping their neck with two hands. But Avanash recounted that when they were in the honeymoon suite, Michaela walked in and saw him holding a wallet. She asked what he was doing. She couldn't have known that Sandeep was in the bathroom. When the girl tried to prevent Avanash from leaving the room, standing in his way, Sandeep approached her from behind and wrapped one hand around her neck. The thing is, the autopsy report was compiled much later, and it confirmed that everything happened exactly as Avanash described. How could Avanash have invented such a method of strangulation if he didn't know it for sure? Additionally, Avanash mentioned that Michaela hit her head on the floor when she fell. The bruise on the back of her head, found during the autopsy, confirmed that as well. Furthermore, in summarizing the case, the judge reminded everyone that Avanash made his confession on January 12th, and signed it on the 13th in the presence of his lawyer. If the police wanted to fabricate the confession, they would have forced Avanash to sign something else on the 12th. Moreover, the boy was examined by three doctors on different days, and none of them found any signs of torture on him. After the acquittal verdict, a new investigation was initiated. The police focused on a crucial piece of evidence, the keycard that the thief and murderer used to enter the room. However, even the mechanism of these locks cannot be trusted. The locks are not synchronized, and each of the 240 locks in the Legends Hotel shows its own time on the security systems panel, making it impossible to determine the exact time when the killer entered Michaela's room. As a result, the alibi of practically any suspect is in question because the exact time of the crime is unknown. To make matters worse, another significant loophole was found in the hotel's guest security. This loophole could increase the number of potential suspects from dozens to hundreds. If the hotel owns the guest rooms, restaurants, bars, golf courses and similar areas, the beach is considered public property. According to Mauritian law, the island's beaches belong to the local residents, and fishermen and traders have always had full access to both the beach and the hotel's premises. Local traders sell their crafts to tourists, and young boys are accustomed to spending time on the hotel's grounds. In other words, 
Despite the cameras, gates, and security personnel, the hotel is unable to provide complete protection of its premises, and there is no way to verify who had access to the honeymoon suite. As a result, the new investigation into the case also ended up with no significant breakthroughs. Under international pressure, the Mauritian police revisited Michaela's murder multiple times and even enlisted the services of a French laboratory for retesting DNA samples. In 2014, there was information about a breakthrough in the case when DNA found on Michaela's clothing matched the DNA of one of the suspects. However, this discovery was insufficient to warrant a new trial. In 2017, in an attempt to draw attention back to the case, John announced a substantial reward for information about the case. A few weeks after his return home, he received a call from a lawyer informing him that the arrests of Sondeep and Avanash were now inevitable. The lawyer did not specify the new evidence that made this possible, but Michaela's family felt relieved and believed that they would finally achieve justice. However, weeks and months passed, and no one was arrested. The case was officially closed in 2020, but in 2021, under pressure from Irish politicians, the Mauritian government agreed to reopen the case. The problem lies in the fact that the willingness to re-examine the case does not guarantee that it will be solved. Investigating any murder after 10 years is challenging, let alone considering the possibility that officials in Mauritius may lack the desire to find the killers. Over the course of 10 years, Many investigators have climbed the career ladder, and if something is revealed in the case that many would prefer to bury, heads will roll. After the trial, John and Michaela's family filed a lawsuit against the hotel for 1.6 million euros. They settled the case out of court, and the details of the agreement are not disclosed, but the money went to a foundation established in Michaela's honor. Legends Hotel was renamed Lux Hotel and continues to enjoy immense popularity, as does Room 1025, which underwent renovations and was assigned the new number 1026. John, who now works as an accountant, met a pleasant girl named Tara Brennan at a memorial dinner for Michaela in 2013. Tara, also an accountant, received a marriage proposal from John in 2015. Last year, the couple welcomed their first child, James McCavery.